Welcome to Boom. Where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Today, we're talking with Professor Jacob Gooden. Jacob is an associate professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, California, and was previously the head strength and conditioning coach and sports scientist for East Eastern Tennessee State University's men's and women's tennis teams. So thank you so much, Jacob, for being here today. We're so excited to hear more about your experiences and, and what you're doing for the scientific community, which is a lot. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Hannah and Melissa. So can you take us through when you first became interested in kinesiology and strength and conditioning or just this general passion for sports and sports performance? Yeah, definitely. So, gosh, I guess it kind of starts quite a ways back. Um, There's kind of a running joke that most uh, (laughs) strength coaches and sports scientists get into it because they tried to be athletes and, you know, eventually we hit our limits and then we (laughs) tried to stay around in sport. (laughs) Um, so for me, it started in the third grade. I was, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a long time ago. I didn't actually know then anything about sports science, but um, I was, I, I always liked being the fastest kid in the class. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I also really enjoyed uh, running the most laps in the fun run. And so my wow. PE teacher that year There's told me. There's not very many of you, yeah. I feel. <laughs> I know. I was, I was kind of a running nerd back then. Um, my, PE teacher, my PE teacher told me, uh, and I forget if it was a man or a woman, but they said, you know, Jacob, if you take longer steps, you'll run faster. And so I said, okay. And I started trying oh. to lengthen my stride, um, <clears throat> which I think ultimately at that point was a little bit detrimental because then I developed this uh, kind of massive heel striking gait. Um, Mm. But I still was able to run. I still did pretty well. I did track and cross country in high school and then in college. But eventually I started accumulating injuries uh, in in the ankle, Mm. particularly in the posterior tibialis, and nobody could fix it. And I was like, you know, what the heck? I thought we had, uh, you know, athletic trainers. And they were great, you know, but they they didn't necessarily uh, have slow motion devices to assess my my running gait Mm. or anything like that. Um, so I right. iced it and I recovered and I spent a year in the pool um, and I ran decently well but uh, my senior year I, I just got to the point where I couldn't run at all and so I was like you know what I'm gonna start tackling this myself and by then by then I was a kinesiology major I didn't know what it was when I entered college uh, kind of by a fluke I entered kines 101 with my friend because we heard it was was kind of fun I thought it was like something to do with brain science I had no idea what the word kinesiology was, <laughs> and, and when I found out that you could just study the human body and performance, I was like, yes, count me in, this is, this is great, this is way better than my business major that I was in before, so, um, so I started putting all of that to work and started realizing, oh, okay, there's, m- maybe it's important the way that your foot contacts the ground, and maybe there's something to mm. strength training and, and uh, proprioceptive training. I'd never, hardly ever set, w- uh, set foot into the weight room. Uh, before this, so, um, <clears throat> our, you know, our coach had us do circuit training and stuff like that, but but nothing really uh, very targeted. And so just through my research, I came across this paper um, by, and I wrote it down because I want to make sure I gave credit. I know I know Dr. Kramer was on it, who I actually got to talk to this, this last week, which was pretty cool. Um, Hasegawa, Yamachi, and Kramer, and it was foot strike patterns at the 15 kilometer point during an elite level half marathon. And so I read this paper and it was talking about how the ground contact time of the foot strike shortened uh, in relation to the, the finishing time of the half marathon runner. So basically mm-hmm. the faster you were in this elite half marathon race, the shorter your ground contact time was. And so, and which you know now seems pretty intuitive. Um, but at the time I mm-hmm. thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting. So the longer that your foot spends on the ground, um, maybe the slower you are. But the other thing that correlated that um, performance with was the type of foot strike. So whether it was a heel strike, a midfoot strike, or a forefoot strike, mm. I thought, oh, maybe midfoot and forefoot striking is, uh, is better for running. And the more I looked into it, the more I saw that overpronation injuries such that I had tended to be more highly correlated with mm. people who are, who are heel strikers. 
Um, so I took mm-hmm. the course of that season to, uh, this was my senior year. I could run, I could run like a mile at a time before my both both ankles just started searing with pain. And the doctors told me like, if you keep going, you're go- you're gonna have surgery. You're gonna have a rupture. Um, so I took that season to completely retool my running stride. I got rid of all of my, you know, motion control overbuilt shoes that, uh, you know, they were hawking at the time. Like it was like wearing snow sh- tires or shoes on your feet. You know, <laughs> so much stability. I I remember my first barefoot run that I went on the next day. I couldn't even walk because all the muscles of my lower legs were just yeah. completely thrashed. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's that was crazy and there's definitely something to this because there's muscles in my legs I didn't even know I had and I was a runner. Um, So between barefoot running and uh, a slow gradual progression into that, consciously changing my foot strike uh, patterns, adopting much more of a minimal shoe style. So not not necessarily like the barefoot zero drop shoes but I switched to only training in racing flats um, and just for a short bursts at a time, not that that's necessarily better for distance running, it's not, but uh, since I was a middle distance runner, I could get away with mostly track workouts, especially because up to that point, I had a decent volume of aerobic work. Um, so yeah, what, what I noticed then was that, okay, the only thing that solved this problem for me was a good deal of research, um, thinking outside the box, mm. tackling it from multiple directions because I adopted strength, some strength training as well. I had no idea what the heck I was doing, but I was learning as I went and, uh, and, and thinking about this problem biomechanically. And so I was, you know, I, I didn't run as fast as I had my junior year or my sophomore year, but uh, I was able to run and I was able to race and it kept me in the game and, you know, I was able to be on relay teams and be competitive in that way. Uh, at the same time, I read Born to, Born to Run by Daniel, well, not by yep. Daniel mm-hmm. Lieberman, but his, his research is, is uh, mm-hmm. a heavy focus in the book. And so, you know, it's kind of like a fun, a fun read, but it turned me on to Lieberman's research. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of, I guess, a long-winded <laughs> explanation or a genesis story as to why I got into sports science, because it helped me personally as an athlete, and that's what I was passionate about. And when it was time for me to hang up the shoes, at, uh, you know, at, when I was done, uh, when I graduated, I just was passionate about helping other people do the same thing to figure out, like, how can, how can we leverage all of the sciences, mm. you know, not just exercise physiology, mm. which is what I think a lot of us sort of get a, a really good um, education in, in an undergrad ex phys department. It's heavy on the exercise physiology, but not just that, but biomechanics, nutrition, strength and conditioning. Uh, mm. mechanics, uh, what else, psychology, how can we leverage all of those sciences to help to drive human performance? And, and I didn't realize it, but at the, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but that's really the definition of, of sports science is, is driving performance through what we know uh, in all of the scientific disciplines. Wow. What a cool story and like such a personal journey and like you in exploring that and figuring out that you really need all those different things not only to help yourself in your sort of acute instance but also in now paying it forward and and teaching about all of that and and learning about all that in your science communication that's such a cool yeah um such a cool origin story it definitely (laughs) helps that it's so personal you know because i feel like right it's not just something i've read about in a textbook i've lived it at least my version of it i've lived it exactly and i know uh, you know, when I'm talking to some of my students, uh, especially who are, who have come from a background of athletics, I know that they're living their own version of that as well. And a lot of people in the mm-hmm. industry, uh, they all have their own personal mm-hmm. stories. And so it's, yeah, I think it's so important to not forget that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious how sort of all of these different uh, fields of study play a role in your life right now, including, you know, we like to talk about biomechanics, but I, I love all the other ones that you named there too. So um, yeah, wh- how are you using those? How are you integrating them? What are you doing right now? Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> right now I would say as a as a professor, I teach one course in biomechanics. I actually, I actually might not be teaching it next year. Uh, it's just the basic intro to applied biomechanics. Um, and I've taught that a couple times uh, just to stay fresh with the material and because I enjoy it. But really it comes more right. into play in my strength and conditioning course uh, where I prepare my students to take mm. the certified strength and conditioning exam uh, by the NSCA, which is essentially the cert, the cert that you need in order to coach at the collegiate level as a strength and conditioning coach. And, uh, and some sport coaches might need it as mm. well. 
Um, biomechanics is, is huge in the strength and conditioning research field, uh, as both of you probably know. And so we use a, a lot there. Also, though, I help our strength and conditioning apart, department out with athlete monitoring. So when I got here to Point Loma, we had uh, this really bright young coach, and we still have him, thankfully, um, Eric Pedersen. <laughs> and he, he since then has gone through our graduate program, and so I've gotten to have him as a student. Oh, He's just cool. a few years younger than me, and so we kind of... Uh, were able to partner up. He was very open to a lot of the ideas that I brought from ETSU to Point Loma. Um, and so when I said, hey, Eric, I, I want to start an athlete monitoring program. Here's what it would look like. He was, he was totally on board and uh, really mm -hmm. helped me flesh out those ideas and gave me a lot of really good input and was willing to put in the hours and the, uh, the time that it took for him to to wow. learn and understand the force plate technology and, and to invest in timing gates and force platforms and uh, to start a graduate assistantship program so we can have students coming through. So now what we do, and this is kind of where biomechanics overlaps with the strength and conditioning stuff, is that we assess our athletes' um, vertical jumping characteristics on a, on a weekly basis mm -hmm. for some of the teams and definitely on a monthly or semesterly mm -hmm basis for all the teams. So we're looking at things like not only, of course, jump height, but lower body peak power or um, strength to body weight ratio, the reactive strength index, hmm. all of those types of things that are potential markers of fatigue for them or could signal that they are either making appropriate gains in the weight room, whether it's explosive strength or reactive strength, um, or maybe if they're lagging behind uh, in a certain area, then we can adjust their training and shift things accordingly. Um, and also even looking at right to left asymmetries, which doesn't detect injury, so to say, but it's more of like a red flag if we notice like, hey, this athlete is continually favoring the right side. We can, that can just be a point of conversation between us and them. And, you know, oftentimes you ask a kid like, hey, you know, hey, did you notice uh, like when you were jumping that you leaned one way or another, they might not know. And then you can show them the forced time curve tracing. And uh, oh wow, that's that's really crazy. There it is, right there on the screen. And then you could coach them into a better position. Or sometimes they reveal, ah, well, you know, I have maybe this nagging injury or groin injury or hip pain. And then you can say, well, why didn't you talk to the trainer about it? And they can say, you're right, I should talk mm -hmm. to the trainer. So you know, just catching those things before they become an issue down the road. So that's that's been really huge. Mm -hmm. um, I I I have others, but maybe can we'll stop there. <laughs> I'm just curious if you could talk more about what this monitoring program mm -hmm. looks like. Are you assessing athletes before the season starts in a lab? Are you do you have equipment that you use throughout the season monitoring them in practice and games or what does that sort of look like um, in practice? Yeah, great question, Melissa. So it's essentially I, you could describe it. Um, I'll describe it using like three pillars so then usually I have like a model that I put up <laughs> of a figure that I put made on PowerPoint <laughs> or something but um, actually maybe I'll just send you guys a white paper you can put that in the show notes so it, it's this yeah, model that, nice. that was introduced to me when I did my graduate work at ETSU and it's an alliance between the academic and athletic um, uh, departments where the kinesiology department uh, we uh, functions kind of as the knowledge base, as the knowledge and sort of the research wing, right? Um, students come in to us and they want an education in sport performance, at least on the graduate side. Undergrad, undergrad side, we prepare them for a lot of careers, but the ones who are interested in sport performance can be a part of this too. So they come in and they want hands-on experience. They want to be in the action. So we train them up until they're ready to do that. And then we bring them into the weight room or onto the field or onto the court. And we say, okay, you're gonna help us monitor the physical and physiological and sometimes psychological outputs of our athletes. And so they get hands-on experience using some of these tools, force platforms that are mobile and connect to Bluetooth and we could run them from our phones, which is really nice. In the battle days, we didn't have that. Um, timing gates, uh, <laughs> uh, motion tracking devices, uh, some sports specific things that we use, um, you know, session RPE, basic athlete monitoring tools. Um, so they get hands on with that and they get to interact with athletes and be part of the team. And then what the teams get out of it, of course, is that we, we tell the coaches and particularly Eric, the strength coach, he's kind of our liaison to the coaches. He has a great relationship with all of them. and so. I go through him and then he goes to the coaches just to make it easy and we say, hey, 
we can provide you with all of this data and we'll do our best to make it actionable. But we never, what we don't ever want to do, we never want to tell the head coach what to do because they're the strategic and mm, um, right. you know technical genius for the sport. They run the ship, they steer the ship. We can, what we do is we just illuminate some of the darker corners of their athlete's physiology or performance for them. We can say, hey, this person is your fastest person in a straight line, but they need some work uh, you know, changing directions, especially to the left, or you know, things like that, and they can they can take that information and use mm-hmm. it as they will. It also gives the athletes kind of that buy into the program, where they're like, "Oh, this is cool! Like I'm being mm-hmm. studied. I have these, I have this technology. Like this is uh, this is definitely um, a win for me." So they like it, and then they can also have that accountability, where you know maybe they see their buddy who's really succeeding in a lot of ways. Um, and they think I, I bet I need to step it up because I know I've been sandbagging it. So, mm. so the sports teams provide the the data to the research, uh, the researchers, which would be my grad students and I, and I provide the education to the grad students mm-hmm. and that hands on. Um, and then together, my students and I provide that service to the athletes. So it's like this trifecta, these three pillars mm-hmm. of uh, we only make each other stronger, you know. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And it's and as far as timetables go. We definitely assess each team at the start and the end of their in-season and off-season. And then some teams, kind of depending on the team, depending on time availability and how many GAs we have any given year, uh, they'll, we'll also have um, in-season monitoring that just sort of goes week to week. So for instance, this year, we are introducing um, Catapult GPS technology in our women's soccer team. We're able to partner with them and I have two incoming sports science GAs and they'll be running the GPS for those teams at practice and at games so we can monitor mm. you know, their training load and heart rate uh, data throughout practice. So yeah, a lot of really cool opportunities. Too much for me to like sometimes keep track <laughs> of, which is why I'm thankful yeah. that, that the GAs are of course here to, to help and like spread out and, and be with the teams. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. Yeah, and it's so cool to hear that you have like athlete buy-in too. Like, I think that's such a key piece. Well, the coaches, the athletes, that and that you all are these sort of equal pillars. I like that you're sort of and like a team together um, in this endeavor. It makes it does make everything stronger, and also it makes it better, right? And makes it real. Yeah, um, definitely. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so switching gears a little bit, it's so cool to hear about how you're using all of this in practice and your research and with your students. Uh, but we also want to touch on your fantastic YouTube channel where you have videos spanning movement science, everything from at-home workouts that you lead to statistics and kinesiology and biomechanics. Uh, so really just great topics and such rich content. Um, we're wondering what motivated you to start this um, start sharing this knowledge via videos on YouTube you know what and what is your home run what does a success look like to you for yeah this yeah that's a great question um, so I started the channel two years ago I, I think roughly maybe a little over two years ago now and I, I remember very vividly um, and I mentioned to you guys before the show that um, that I had a few manuscripts to write up and then COVID hit and I and I pushed them off and I, now I'm picking them mm-hmm. back up. Mm-hmm. But I remember very vividly back in March, um, you know, I busted open these older manuscripts from my time um, at ETSU that I really needed to just finish and, and get sent out for a publication. And then a week after I restarted all of that, I, we started you know hearing everything about COVID and, and that things were going to be closing down for a while and we all had our fingers crossed like maybe just a mm-hmm. week maybe two weeks who really knows uh, and <laughs> right. then we all know what happened right mm-hmm. I don't need to rehash all of it but <laughs> I had to make a decision because we were hearing all of this chatter in the higher education community of what's this going to do to our institutions we're going to have to go remote mm-hmm. at least for the remainder of the semester mm-hmm. and who knows for how long and mm-hmm. so I started thinking a few things first of all I was thinking I do not want to teach over Zoom. I don't I don't want to do it. Some yeah. of my colleagues have done an amazing job with their Zoom pedagogy and I was, I was like that's great for them. Um, I I tried mm-hmm. a couple times. It didn't go super well. Maybe I just didn't stick mm-hmm. with it for long enough. But the other thing I was thinking was uh, this might this might bring a big change to higher education. I didn't really know what type of a change because I I don't mm-hmm. know, I'm not a prophet in that way, but I knew something would happen. Like there's a massive shift to online and I know that 
once you get set up in an easier, more convenient way to digest information, like you mm -hmm. don't even have to put pants on and go to class. You can just sit on your bed <laughs> with your computer mm -hmm. and be on Zoom and you're in class, you know, <laughs> learning. Hopefully, hopefully you're learning if your prof did a good job. And so I thought, I don't know, maybe, maybe I should do this a different way. Uh, the other, the other two factors that played into it, uh, one was that I didn't have any proof of, to anyone outside of my class that I could explain or understand or, or give good lectures on the content that I was giving. Does that make sense? Like as a hmm. professor, you kind of have your publication record, which mine is not very strong yet, uh, working on that. Um, and then you have how you teach. And I'm at a teaching institution, so we, they, we put a lot of value on how well can we communicate mm. with our students? And I thought, man, if mm. our if our institution closed, um, that that would really be, <laughs> that would really stink for a lot of reasons. But I I'd have to go out and interview and prove again, you know, that I'm worth hiring as a as a tenure track professor. Mm. And so I thought maybe if I film really good lecture videos, not only could I do my students the best service possible by giving that to them mm. and they can watch it over and over again. And then I can interact with them more personally via email or office hours. But also it would build up for me kind of a portfolio of teaching uh, mm. that I could kind of fall back on or send to people and just say, hey, here's a small sample of uh, you know some things I've done. And then thirdly, like God forbid, if Point Loma had to close and we saw other institutions very similar to ours close during the pandemic, I thought maybe knowing how to how to shoot and edit video would be another good skill uh, because I don't know what I'm mm -hmm. going to be doing in a year if that happens. So, um, oh, and the fourth thing is that my wife was a wedding photographer. So she had her <laughs> like really nice DSLR camera, which I, I had oh, to nice. promise her I wouldn't drop it and, you know, mess it up. <laughs> I, I said, I'm going to be so careful with it um, if you let me use it to film uh, these lecture videos. So all of those things came together. Sorry, this is super long winded. Yeah, but, yeah. But um, it all came together uh, and culminated in me deciding I'm just going to really go for this thing. And I watched hundreds of hours of other YouTubers explaining how to make videos on YouTube and how to use a camera and, and just man the, everything it, there was so much information i was drinking through a fire hose and at the same time shooting my lecture videos and editing on this laptop that died like every 10 minutes mm. because of the file sizes oh my god using. and it was a hard it was like a hard spring and summer um but i would i would say it paid off i think uh, i'm glad i did it and I honestly, I, I'm just super happy because I think my students learned something. I think they learned well in that style, watching the video lectures, and then we could interact on office hours yeah. or through applied assignments. Um, so yeah, that's that's the long-winded answer as to why I started a YouTube channel. <laughs> and have you heard from other students then, mm -hmm. let's say outside of your classes, the people that have been watching the videos on YouTube? And I guess what I'm trying to get at and, and what I'm really curious about is what you kind of touched on is this transformation and education. And this is probably a bigger topic than we could cover, but I'm super curious about your thoughts on this because um, just from your perspective and seeing how powerful these your lectures can be and how widely they can be disseminated when it's good content too and and how many people can learn from it um because i'm i'm also thinking how education is going to be changing in these times you know having a professor in person versus who's you know you're already doing a million things as a professor right and teaching is another one of them which i'm i know so many professors want to do an amazing job at but it's hard to really put time into making really good um lectures and material for students versus these videos that are becoming available online that are really high quality and students can learn mm -hmm. the material in that way perhaps even better um but you know maybe they're not being updated every quarter every year like a regular mm -hmm. class would be but um they're just really accessible like you're saying so i'm I, i'm just wondering your thoughts on how you think that's going to um perhaps change education yeah. um yeah <laughs> i'm gonna restart my camera really quick just pausing okay there we go sorry i hit record a little early so i hit the record limit um yeah, no, that, that's a great question, Melissa, and, and I appreciate you asking that because at the end of the day, you know, it's, 
it's fun to look back and see the videos that I made, but if it's not actually improving the learning outcomes for students, um, then, mm -hmm. then why do it in the first place? And so, um, yeah, I, I would say I have probably three different answers for that. Um, the first is that at Point Loma, they, the feedback from my students who I have here, who are students here at Point Loma, uh, was just immensely positive and, and really overwhelmingly mm -hmm. so. And I was, I was just so, I, I think, thankful to, the, <laughs> to my students for being gracious. And like, there were a lot of weeks where I was like, mm -hmm. hey guys, sorry, I didn't get the lecture video out in time. Um, you know, often due to technical difficulties or I just didn't get edited mm. soon enough or the kids were all at home doing homeschool with my wife oh. uh, and, I w and I was like down in the, in our guest bedroom and it was just like too crazy to film that day or something. But for whatever reason, you know, they were, um, sometimes they were late and, and the students were just so gracious. Uh, but they also said some really good things mm -hmm. about, about like, hey, like, you know, com compared to the learning in some of our other classes, this has been very helpful. And so that was recognized mm -hmm. by some of our, um, uh, by, by our office of, oh, I'm gonna get it wrong, office of like teaching and learning. Basically the people who help us to oh, teach cool. really well. Um, and, and they're amazing, yeah. uh, Dr. Joe Clemens uh, o over there. She, she was really formative in helping me establish my teaching philosophy and like, understanding once I got here that hey there's more ways to teach than just standing at the front and lecturing off of slides mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so she actually uh, was really big in helping uh, in, in putting me uh, kind of I guess give elevating uh, what I was doing and and using my channel as a as an example to the rest of the university and just saying hey like not that everyone has to do this by any means but if you want to teach well through video here's a way to do it and we and we looked at mm -hmm. some of those learning outcomes and and so that that was really cool that was really good feedback and i i was just really grateful for the support of our community here uh the other the other feedback i've gotten which has been so cool has been j the international community of people who are studying to become strength and conditioning coaches and sports scientists and mm -hmm. and and especially people taking that cscs certification Mm -hmm. Just uh, every day or every other day, I get emails from people in India or Brazil or um, you know all over the world who say, mm. "Hey, I I can't afford to go back to school to study this stuff, or I didn't understand it when my professor uh, lectured it uh, lectured on this, or I I don't quite understand the textbook, but your your videos have helped me so much." Uh, and I'm really thankful and I just took the test and I passed it on the first try um, and and that wow. is just, that's just so uh, it's such a blessing to me to hear that and to know that something that I'm passionate about uh, is now going out and you know that information is helping other people and the some of the best emails mm -hmm. are from people who during I two I got two of these emails where during the pandemic uh, these two gentlemen they they realized they didn't want to do what they were doing, their career path, and they wanted to transition into coaching. And so two different gentlemen who oh. quit their jobs, studied to get the CSCS certification using my, hmm. uh, using my video series, passed the tests, and are now track and field coaches and you know, having success wow. with, with their athletes and telling me like, oh, you're like, remember that one thing you said in that video? Like, I think of that one. Uh, you know, during this scenario with my athletes and just just like mm -hmm. amazing that there's, you know, even though there's like two or three or four degrees of separation, that's something that I did in our guest bedroom, filming it somehow is positively, <laughs> yeah, positively impacting the performance of this high school athlete or this collegiate athlete who I'll never meet probably. Uh, it, it's really cool. It's really gratifying. Um, so that was the second, <laughs> that's the second thing. And then the third, the third piece of uh, really positive feedback is actually th this last week in New Orleans at the National NSCA Conference, um, just getting to meet a lot of the folks who work for the NSCA. And uh, I was shocked mm -hmm. that <laughs> so many of them said, oh, you're Jacob Gooden. I know you because I see your videos all the time and uh, let's set up a meeting and let's talk and and just really cool collaboration opportunities uh -huh. lots of people coming up to me in person at the conference and saying you know I I just want to let you know I I've I feel like I know you because I've watched about a hundred hours of you lecturing and I'll, I'll say oh, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry you had to sit through that and, and uh, but just really cool uh, opportunities to connect with people from I feel like all walks of life who are 
getting into the strength and conditioning or sports science profession. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, the two years of, of work that I put into the channel have been totally worth it for the relationships that I've been mm-hmm. able to start in that way. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. And it's like amazing that to see the impact of your work. And I can imagine you said that summer, that spring and summer were really hard. Like if only you could kind of see the light <laughs> then yes. that you see now and like really it's amazing you were able to push through and really uh, what a service you've done to the community. Um, so we are really appreciate that and applaud mm-hmm. you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you. Hugely. Um, I'm wondering if there are any like tips you have or learning, you know, learnings from um, your experiences and getting the different feedback that you've gotten that you might share with others who are trying to either maybe on a small scale share science or on a larger scale, like on a YouTube platform, mm-hmm. share science. Totally. I would I would say the first step is to find something that's reproducible, find a workflow that's repeatable. Mm. And like th- that was a big mm. thing for me is that the more steps that it took before I could actually hit record and sit down, the fewer videos I could record. Like you said, mm. professor's job, yeah. like it takes us a lot of our hours in the day to just do the, the varied things that we need to do as professors. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. So whether that's, you know, you get your phone and you set it up on a tripod and you have it you just do it the same way every time and then each time you tweak one little thing and make it better and it's okay if your first few videos or attempts are not that great and you can always delete Mm -hmm. them later that's okay (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I have a few videos that I've hidden on my channel (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know you know what's so funny is that so something I learned was that China does not allow YouTube in their country Um, then said they have something called Billy Billy and I found this out because one day I was like, you know, I haven't Googled myself in a long time. I wonder if my videos would come up if I Google my name. So I Google my name. I'm like going through the pages. And then I found the, this link with all these Chinese characters and I clicked on it. And somebody in China has pirated my entire YouTube channel and hard coded <gasps> Chinese subtitles on the bottom and posted it on Billy Billy. <laughs> and so I use Google Translate to, to try to read it. And the, the comments are just so funny because... You know, of course, it, they, there's probably a lot of like cultural meaning that's lost in, in translation, um, but just the emojis and uh. everything are hilarious. And I'm getting more views in China than I am in, <laughs> in America. Um, so I was, I, at first I was like, oh, that's kind of lame. But then I realized, you know what? I, I guess if people in China want, want to learn this stuff, then I'm happy it, it's over there. Um, wow. Yeah. But yeah, I would say find a reproducible workflow and just tweak one or two things every time. It's just mm-hmm. like science, you know, you, you have to reproduce it yeah. and then you figure out what works and whatever's not really working, you tweak it and then you you like test that hypothesis again mm-hmm. and you just keep going mm-hmm. forwards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you expect with science changing and new discoveries in science, will that impact the videos that you've made Um, And do you expect to have to, like, update them a lot? Or um, do you feel like you have this really solid, like, Mm -hmm. foundation of videos that you feel like can last um, a long time? That's a great question. So thankfully, most of the videos that I've put out are based more on uh, textbook information, which is maybe not quite as cutting edge, but it's also maybe a little bit more uh, foundational. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the things... In most of the content in the videos um, is is fairly foundational knowledge that I don't think will change but if it does I think yeah. one of the most important things that we can be teaching our students about science is how to hold on to truth loosely uh, that science mm. is just an approximation of the mm-hmm. truth it's our it's our best uh, guess I use the word guess but it, it's our best uh, <laughs> yeah our best guess as to what the truth is and if that is ever challenged, which it should be all the time, then Mm -hmm. if that's challenged, then we need to adjust and we need to adjust our thinking. Some of the people who I respect the most are the people who hold a very strong opinion and they back it up with evidence and then later they come out and say, you know what, I was wrong. Or at least right now, Mm -hmm. the evidence that I'm seeing is leading me to believe that that previous conclusion was incorrect. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that 
that is such a good look for professors to wear frequently. Mm. So even in my classes, I tell my students, if you find a mistake in a question and you challenge it and you give me really good rationale and you think you deserve a point and, and you can point back to the literature and point out an instance where your answer would have been correct, I'll give you the point back. And I'll, and I'll say it in mm. front of the whole class so that you, know, you get credit for that. Wow. And so that you guys learn to not just take truth as an assumption. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, right. so I guess to answer your question, uh, I think I would be excited to go back and make a video and say, like, why I was wrong about such and such. That would probably get some good clicks. <laughs> and, <Yeah>. and also, <laughs> and also <laughs> I think it's good to, to lead by example in that way. Mm. I'm curious, like, could you share a time when you stumbled across one of these sort of um, misconceptions um, and how it sort of affected individuals and yeah just so we can sort of get an idea of this I love that yeah. I love your teaching model too <laughs> thanks I think we should um, adopt that <laughs> so yeah misconceptions in strength there's so I would say there's a lot of misconceptions sure. the thing the thing with misconceptions are is that I think they happen most frequently when people are thinking um, uh, with the sort of either or heuristic or like very like like very dichotomous thinking like it's either yes or no or good mm. or bad so mm-hmm. in the exercise yeah. world you get this a lot like like top five exercises that you should never do or like don't eat these foods right. they're bad for you in these ways um, or carbs are bad yeah or these types of carbs are bad yeah or don't eat before like all of these sort of um, uh, it's like people want truisms? rules, right? They want rules. I feel. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're so right. They want to so know, right. is this going to work or is this right. not going to work? <laughs> yes or no. And that's just, yeah, it's a total opposite from science. science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You As, have to get so yeah. used to navigating <laughs> the fuzzy with science. And, and that's what I try to teach my students, yeah. too, is, you know, if they come in at, to the weight room and, and uh, maybe an assignment would be to program uh, a, a training session for a certain type of athlete, let's say, but they also have to mm-hmm. back it up with evidence, uh, biomechanical evidence or physiological evidence or, or um, just what they've learned in the class as to why their session it would be a good session for this athlete. And mm-hmm. in that process of defending the session that they've created, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I didn't have them do, do this exercise because it's bad for the knees or this exercise is, is not good because of X, Y, or Z. And I always, always, always push back on that because it's never, there are no bad exercises. There are no bad foods. There Mm -hmm. are no right, there are no um, right ways to train where that's only the right, the only right way. You know, it's just, we have to start thinking more on this uh, spectrum of Mm -hmm. this is a better exercise than that, but it's not, it's not a good one and this is not a bad one. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good point. It's it's interesting to, I think, see how science is interpreted too. And mm-hmm. sometimes it's this like in-between role where we have a scientific publication that maybe the typical like lay population isn't going to read. And then you have things that are super accessible to people that they're going to read, but maybe they're not as backed by science and then Mm -hmm. it's kind of like how do we bridge these Mm -hmm. things but I really appreciate that it feels like your YouTube channel um, and your teaching really does a good job of of bridging those and just presenting it to people in a really um, accessible way. Thanks yeah and and that's a really good point that you made Melissa because there are a lot of tremendous coaches who don't read the literature they don't understand the science but they're mm-hmm. tremendous coaches, mm-hmm. and, and what they do with their athletes is mm-hmm. phenomenal. And I, and I would I would challenge any like scientist to reproduce the quality of performance that that coach mm. does. And so, yeah. and I think that there's a sort of a disconnect there too with people who say, "Oh, I'm only like an evidence based coach or or whatever strength coach." It happens a lot in the strength coach community where you sort of have almost a clash of philosophical approaches where there's the one approach. I, uh, for lack of a better term, but this is not supposed to be derogative, I would call it like the meathead approach of um, kind of ignoring the science and, and just, you know, going in with, <laughs> um, with intensity and doing what has always been done. 
and it's all and the reason yeah. why it's always been yeah. done is because there's actually like a lot of really good um, uh, outcomes with those ways and then there's the sort of the other opposite hmm. end of the spectrum where you get people who only do things that they've read in studies uh, and they and they'll stop doing something if any single <laughs> research study points out anything <laughs> wrong you know what I'm saying but but that's not yes. that's not how sport yeah. performance works and so we have to really do this tricky dance of of interpreting the mm -hmm. evidence and applying it in a, to our heuristics into our into the lens that we're viewing training through without um, mm -hmm. yeah without landing on either ends of these spectrums we have to walk that middle yeah. road right. yeah yeah exactly because it's and both of those are so important and just because of, also knowing as a researcher knowing all of the things that go into a research study that sometimes aren't even yeah. in the manuscript too you totally. know that's specific lab setting and the types mm -hmm. of people that are in the study and you know when it's taking place and how and all of these all of these variables that are in this research study and then you're trying to project them onto this other very specific situation and this other athlete who may be a completely different person than any of those participants and um, so it does I think yeah require this sort of balance of really testing out what works for an individual mm -hmm. but trying things out and being open to you know what we're finding in science and although I think that can be challenging challenging too it's for athletes at a really high level wanting to right. um, change anything um, but yeah it's um it's it's tricky but it's nice to I think see the value in both of these really starting to come out and I think people starting to see the value in, in both of those mm -hmm. for sure yeah great yeah. points yeah, it's kind of cool how I think we, that brings us back to your message in your teaching about holding truth loose, loosely and teaching students to do that. I kind of think I'm hearing that in maybe how coaches might act too, like the best coaches might hold truth a little bit loosely and that they're adaptable, but they also have some you know grounding principles that they're going by, but they're adaptable and can individualize to different athletes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, I can't believe it's oh my gosh, <laughs> <We're yeah. laughs> getting close to the end already. Um, but can you tell us about a time that you feel like you failed um, and what you learned from that? Yeah, gosh, I, I have failed a lot of times in life. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. So I, I would say probably the, the biggest one for me well, first of all, I'll say and this is everyone says this, but uh, I try to live by it too. failure, like failure is just falling forward. You know, like when you fail, you learn something from it. <laughs> yeah. And so you go back and do it. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think this is not this is going to be like an old man moment for me and not this is not a knock on the younger <laughs> generation. But I do feel like students, the students that are coming in, um, I, I do notice that their um, tolerance for failure is is very small, like. They, they can't stand failure mm. and and this is not mm. maybe that's too sweeping of a generalization but um, I, I just remember my biggest failures have taught me the most about life because when you fail mm -hmm. and if you really want to achieve that goal that you just failed at it will teach you a better way it all it will always point you mm -hmm. to a better yeah. way if you get back up and you try again but if you stop if you quit mm -hmm. you don't learn anything and, and that's, I mean, that's the value of failure. So for me, I think the most important failure, if we're talking about my career, um, w was that failure to, uh, that failure in athletics when I was in college, you know, the, getting those injuries, sustaining those injuries. Mm. And I don't think I ever maximized my full potential as an athlete because of those injuries. And, injuries. and so I, I do see that as an athletic failure and at the time that was the thing that I cared most about even though that wasn't healthy um, but mm -hmm. but it was a big failure and it was, it was really hard for me to come back from that mentally and psychologically it took me a long time to process the thought of not being a runner anymore but failing in that arena opened up this entire career for me so when I look mm -hmm. back on it I'm grateful for it mm -hmm. Such important lessons and things to keep in mind. And again, that importance of the personal journey and keeping that in mind throughout. Um, s speaking of 
following your personal journey, <laughs> wondering how people can follow you in your work. We've talked about your YouTube channel and we're excited to share that link with people, but are there other ways that we can stay updated with what's going on with you? Yeah, thanks. So I'm not on social media. I made, my wife and I made a conscious decision to, to move <laughs> ourselves from the fray of social media a while ago. So smart. Uh, yeah, no Instagram, no Twitter. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm toying with getting on Twitter because I don't know, everyone's on there who's a researcher and a professor. But as of right mm, now, it's yep. just the YouTube channel. Who knows? Okay. There are some things brewing. Actually, it's not just. There's the <laughs> hundreds yeah. of videos on there. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. You know what I will say, actually? Here, here's something that you guys will be the first to know. Um, Hannah and Melissa. Oh, yeah. exclusive info. Exclusive <laughs> information. So I am starting, I'm starting a podcast also with my colleague, Dr. Cool. Brent Alvar. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Whoa. you guys are excited. That makes me excited. Um, so it's called, it will, we don't even have like a landing page or anything yet, but we have recorded our first three interviews, uh, which was Whoa. like, it, oh man, we had so many technical difficulties, but um, it's called the Innov Innovators in Performance and <laughs> Sports Science Podcast. So I don't know, maybe in a month or so, look for us on iTunes and Spotify. And, and if the first couple <laughs> interviews have some audio glitches, bear with us, we'll get better. <laughs> But um, yeah, we, we had some, some really big heavy hitter guests, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Dr. Stone, uh, Coach Meg, Richie Stone, and um, Dr. Bill Kramer were our first three guests. So really pumped about that. If you're in the sports wow. science community, uh, hopefully you know who those three are. Yeah, what a great that's lineup. Awesome. Cool. Well, we definitely can't relate to any of the technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it our was first five interview years, yeah. like was yeah. yeah. <laughs> Almost 5 years later and we still have them all the time. But um, yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. We're super pumped for you and your podcast and I think it's so cool to, I think to have these different other ways for people to learn and then bringing in other mm -hmm. people too and different perspectives it's been so fun for us so I'm sure it's going to be a blast and um, it's going to be really impactful for a lot of people thank you so yeah, much and we'll definitely share it through our channels too so awesome yeah. awesome <laughs> well, thank that. you all right I think we're getting to our last question which is what are you most excited about for the future of Usually we say biomechanics, but since you cover so many fields, sports science, exercise science, uh, teaching, um, <laughs> education, you pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I, I think I can stick with biomechanics. So I really am excited about optical motion tracking that's made mm -hmm. easy. So like once we can do it just mm -hmm. from our mobile devices with good validity and reliability, like I'm envisioning Imagine an app where you could just take three or four iPhones and position them around uh, on little tripods and those become the cameras, right? You can get like an eight camera setup if eight people are there with their phones and then boom, mm -hmm. you can go. And, and phones are have, phones that have like LiDAR on them now, like it's crazy. Um, and there's even, even apps, I think that exist that do very simple 2D motion tracking. But I'm excited mm -hmm. for, I'm excited for, um, motion capture and motion tracking technology to become easier to use because as a non-professional biomechanist like I don't call myself a biomechanist even though some of my research and teaching involves biomechanics I don't I don't like setting up uh, all the, the camera system and <laughs> working with Cortex and you know uh, getting the motion capture suit on what I would love to do is to go to like a powerlifting meet and set up some sort of an optical tracking system uh, and not interfere at all with the athletes as they're performing, but then still be able to get their tracking data. So I'm excited for that, for developments in that uh, field. And then I'm, I, I'm just also excited about the wearable sensor revolution. You know, like I mentioned Catapult and the GPS and the IMUs that they have in those systems. Uh, so I'm excited mm -hmm. to learn more about that uh, this season as we get hands on with our soccer team um, and just kind of where that goes in the future. Cool. Sounds like, yeah, being able to monitor biomechanics out in the real world in a less invasive and yes. yeah, uh, more, yeah, more fun way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I like your point. Your, I like your emphasis on easy to use. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is something that I 
preach on often is that just because they're making cool technology and things accessible doesn't mean that people will be able to use them or want to use them if they're not exactly. easy to use. So I really appreciate your emphasis on that. And, and I think just showing that how you would use that, like the settings that you would use that and if it was easy to use um, really shows the impact of that. So I know we're super excited for that. Thank you for sharing that. And we're excited to see where, we're also excited to see where the future goes and what cool questions you can start to answer um, as, those, <laughs> as those technologies come out. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And we're excited to share this episode with everyone and excited to have you share it with your community too. Biomechanics off our minds. <laughs>